So here is Nicola Tower, which you can access at, at tower.nf. Uh, and what we're trying to build here is we're going to get to a situation where we want to be able to take our pipelines that we're going to build during this next few days and then sort of run them in, a, uh, in a kind of, any kind of cloud environments as well. So here is, uh, let's just take, say, the RNA seek pipeline. You know, I can select the workflow that I wish to launch. Um, I've got a whole bunch of options and how it links in here. And within a couple of clicks here, we can uh, kick that off here, that job off, and then kind of monitor that and then kind of build it. And the whole point here is that we're, we're going towards this situation where we can create those pipelines and then run them on all different cloud environments here um, and have that kind of full uh, integration as well with our data sets, uh, our runs, and, and, and view all of that as well. The main thing that we're going to start with now is, is just a, a very basic pipeline. And the idea of this pipeline is it's, it's trying to do something which is you're often doing in bioinformatics, which is manipulating files. But also, it doesn't really require any external software, something that you can run anywhere. Um, so skipping through all of this, we're going to start from introduction. Yeah. We've spoken a lot um, you know, over the first hour and stuff about kind of specifics around Nextflow. This material here is just as a kind of uh, uh, for a review or if something that you want to go back to later on. The basics of what we're going to be doing though is defining channels, which really holds our data, processes, which definitions of, of the uh, software we want to run, um, and then the individual tasks um, them, themselves. Here's a little bit of information on essentially the description of what a process is, and this is what we're going to be spending most of the time doing, um, which is typically like the script section contains what you're going to be running here, um, and then how you um, how that links in. So we're going to start with the first script here, and we have a first script which is available there, which is called hello.nf. You should find this in your environment. So if you so here, you can see that there is this hello.nf, which is available. And if I browse to it on the left-hand side, I'm going to open this. If I double click here, you can see that we get this, this text editor um, that, that runs here. So this, this is a process, sorry, this is an Nextflow pipeline, um, which contains a few things. The first of it is a, um, a definition of some parameters, such as an input, which is just hello world as a, as a string. We have this definition of the channel, um, which is the greetings channel. We have the process, what, the first process, which is called split letters, and the second process, which is called convert to upper, and then we're viewing the result. We're going to go through this um, step by step and kind of slowly build this up and try to understand exactly what's taking place. Before we do that, I just want to kind of point out exactly what's taking place here. What are we actually running? Well, the kind of idea is that we are going to be taking a a string, which is in our case, hello world. And you can see the command which is launched here. So this is just something I could print from the screen. So I'm going to copy this into my terminal. And this is what's happening when we're running. So we're running print f, and then we have this essentially hello world section here. So you could copy paste this or as you prefer to run through. So this is running print f hello world, and it's piping it. So it's sending it here, here piping that to a command called split. Uh, split is just a command which is available in your typical kind of Unix system. And what it does is it takes strings and puts them, splits them uh, into files. And what this is doing is it's going to split them in characters of six. So you can think that we've got hello and world will be two of us. So let's just, just show you that here. The final thing it's doing is chunk, which is taking that output and essentially prefixing it. So it's going to have a name chunk before the file. So let's copy paste this here and see exactly what happens. So this is what Nextflow is running under the hood here when we watch this. So nothing kind of, you can't see anything that happened there, but if I look on the left-hand side, you can see chunk AA and chunk AB. So if I just go say cat and chunk AA, you can see this hello and cat and chunk AB world. So this is, this is essentially what we're gonna run. Now, that is how I've done that without using Nextflow, which is what's happening. Now we want to kind of put all of this into a pipeline. Why are we doing this? Well, in bioinformatics, you often have files that you are trying to take, you're trying to manipulate, do something with them. Um, and therefore, it's a kind of good example to start with uh, in terms of uh, what we're doing here. Let's have a look at the second section here, which is the cat. And this is basically catting each file. So catting the file. And then we're going to replace the lowercase letters with uppercase. 
So again, let's paste that in, cat, in our case, chunk AA, and then I'm just gonna copy paste this. And you'll see that when we launch that, it's taking hello and making that uppercase. So we've got two processes. The first one itself is just splitting that string into two files. And then the second one is taking each of those files and converting it to uppercase. Very kind of minimal kind of basic example. Well, what does it look like in Nextflow and, and uh, how do we run that? Well, in Nextflow, we can use this with what's called the Nextflow run command. And this is how we run pipelines. So we can say Nextflow run, and then we point it to the file that we want to run. In our case, we want to say hello. So Nextflow run hello dot nf. And dot nf is typically used for the Nextflow files themselves. You can see that when we launch this, you will see that this says us which file we're running, obviously, the version of Nextflow we're using. You'll see that it says launching hello.nf and it has this name. And this is like a mnemonic name. So it's a name just every time you run Nextflow, it'll create a random name for you to remember um, if you want to go back to that. You can see that it's launched three processes. And you can see this by this number three here. So three processes which are running locally, so the local execution. And here you can see that the first process split letters. There's been one of them. So one of one is completed successfully. The second process convert to upper, there was two of them. And you can see that each one of those is, is run successfully as well. So we've kind of got one uh, task of split letters and two tasks of convert to upper. And this is running here and you can see that the end, the final thing it's doing is printing to us. Let's run this again. And I'm just gonna do this exact same thing and launch again. And notice how this one says, hello world, maybe as you would expect. This one says, hello world. Let's try again. Launch it again. This one says, hello world. And notice how this one now says, world hello. Why is that? This comes back to the data flow programming model. Convert to upper, there's two tasks. They're taking the input, which is essentially file chunk AA, chunk AB. Those processes are running purely in parallel, completely in parallel at the processing level. This means that it's not guaranteed that it was gonna be hello world. It can sometimes be world hello because each of those processes is running independent of the other. And basically what we're seeing here is just the output of that. We're basically seeing those processes here. So split letters runs once, convert to upper, you can think of it as just waiting, right? It's just sitting there. And as soon as the uh, file is received, in our case, chunk AA or chunk AB, it's running this section here. And, those, and that means that kind of ends up being running in parallel completely. And this is kind of the, the basic way that this, um, that this works. We can start to go now into a little bit of the, the syntax into how we write that and kind of why, why we write or kind of write it in this way itself. Um, there's, an, there's this other question here is like, why do we have one process, uh, which is basically this name? So if you look here, you can see you've got this, this little number here. And remember when we spoke about before, we said that each process is independent and each process lives in its own we call working directory. Each of those processes kind of encapsulated. And this here is uh, the hash. It's essentially the location of where that work is taking place. And if you run yours, you're gonna have a different number because this number is built from all of the inputs, all the script, the time, et cetera. And it's kind of unique for that process. We'll get into a, mo into a moment, we'll kind of go through where that comes from and, and, and kind of uh, how it does. But let's, let's first start with the, the actual definition of the pipeline and, and see if we can kind of get a little bit of a grasp of what's taking place here. So you can see here, the first thing we have is a shebang line. This is not necessarily, but it's something that could be useful if you want to define exactly where you want to run Nextflow. You'll see something similar in Perl, Python, et cetera. Here we are defining a parameter and parameters are things which can be defined in this command line, but they can also be defined as uh, inputs and configuration, et cetera. And this is the parameter greeting. So whatever we call this, we can do this. So if you want to call this like greetings or et cetera, you could put in, you can just change that here as well. So anything params dot is something that we can change from the command line. And if we go here and we say next row run, uh, hello. And now what I'm going to do is I can override that parameter. So anything which is params dot, I can say dash dash 
greeting. And then I can say whatever I want here. Like, I'll let, um, what is this? And then you can see that that overrides that now. And now instead of seeing hello world, you can put whatever you want in there. So this is a kind of a, a way to be able to define something that you might have a, have a um, for example, you've got an, a small piece of data which always runs through your pipeline. And then you want to be able to do the same thing and have and kind of override it when you run with your real data for running there as well. Let's have a think about now um, in terms of how this works and uh, the ability to kind of to monitor this as well. So let's say we're running this pipeline and that we, we like this from the start. So we say, okay, this is my split letters. What happens if we want to change it? Right, now we want to start modifying it. And maybe instead of changing it to uppercase, what happens if we wanted to do this and we want to say, okay, launch one, Oops, sorry, cancel that. And then we wanted to like make a difference. So let's say instead of converting to upper, let's like reverse it. We can see that when we start this pipeline, you get the one, two, et cetera, everything is before. Now I want to do something I want to show you. I'm going to reverse it instead of converting to upper. So I'm changing just the second process now. I'm going to save that file. When I'm going to launch this now, I'm going to do something. I'm going to add something in on the line. I'm going to say resume. Here you can see that the first section has stayed the same. The second one we've changed and I'm running here. I want you to take note of what takes place here. Can you notice that this number, 540A2, is the same here? And you'll notice that this task says cached. This is Nextflow's resume functionality, and this is why these numbers are important. What's happened is that we've made changes to the pipeline, but Nextflow has run from the beginning, and it's basically said, okay, that first task, nothing has changed. Everything is the same. And this number, 54A2, is a hash of all of the inputs. So it means that when we run this, it says, okay, I've run that from the beginning. This is already done successfully, completed. I can run it again. I basically, I don't need to run that task again. This is really important when you start to run massive pipelines because you don't want to have to, re you don't want to start your pipeline and you make a change or something happens. You don't want to like begin from the beginning every time you can use this caching mechanism. So, so let's start run the same thing again, exactly the same command now with resume. And I want you to take note of looking at the, um, the, the tasks here. Now you can see that both of those processes were cached. So look, all of the tasks now. So I haven't actually done any compute in this moment. Imagine that each of those tasks was running on the cluster or something like, so literally next flow has gone to that said, hey, this is fine. Everything's been successful. There's no need to run that compute. Um, you can even add files in. I like imagine you had a situation uh, for uh, when you're doing like imagine like a clinical trial and you've got your massive pipeline which you run through with five patients and then another patient gets enrolled. You can then go basically add that patient in as an input and all of the and rerun say your RNAC pipeline, it will start from the beginning, right? but all of the data for the five existing patients, all the processes, all this stuff won't need to be run again. And you're just going to be adding in this so additional patient. This is a kind of very powerful feature that it works in terms of the run. And how does this all work and, and, and what's actually happening in place? So I'm just going to remove here to show you. I'm just going to remove my work directory. To, for, this is for illustration purposes. But all of that, all of the, the caching, all of the hashes taking place inside of this work directory. So let's uh, next go run. Hello again. If we go inside here and we say, I'm just going to run a command tree on my work directory, you'll see what's taking place is that notice that when we've run this, we see B1, D, C, 4, B, you'll have different numbers, 2A, et cetera, et cetera. So we had three tasks which ran. You can see this because it's one of one, two of two. Each of those tasks is inside this working directory. And you can see that inside that, it's got like 2A, D, F, D, D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the second, no, the other task is D, uh, sorry, 6E, et cetera. The next task, B1, blah, blah, blah. Each task has its own directory. Each task lives in its kind of essentially run from that location. And it kind of is more than that though, because each task, in this case, the first task we're trying, let's have a look at that one. The first task is B1, D, C, et cetera. If we look inside of that working directory, B1, D, C, you'll see that there's this file. 
chunk AA and chunk AB. That's the work. That's essentially the, the intermediate files. That's, that's where the command that we ran was run. And those files though, they are living in that location. When we use them as a downstream process, so we want to take chunk AA, we're going to take chunk AB and use them in the next task. Notice this color here and notice this little arrow. What's taking place here is actually symbolically linking the previous task and placing it inside of the new task directory. So chunk AA here and chunk AB, these are just linking to the original one. So you can see this is B1, B, C, et cetera. So when you run in a, either local system or like LSF or in your cluster, the explode is just linking the previous executions together here. And this happens all the way through for like you know, tens of thousands of tasks. And it means that you don't have to copy those files around, but it also means that you've got this kind of resume functionality and this ability to kind of start from the beginning, but then kind of run in, in, in this way as well. So that hopefully, hopefully gives you a little bit of flavor. If you want to go in and you want to say, okay, well, what's actually inside of that? Let's go inside of the CD into the working directory here. You'll see that we've got three files. If we go into 6E here, if you do LS, you can see um, inside of that. The reason for the structure of like having two digits and then the full uh, name, in some situations, like when you want to run in some file systems, they don't like having like so many uh, individual files. So imagine you have like a pipeline with like 10,000 tasks. Some file systems don't like having 10,000 directories in a single directory. So this is the reason for this kind of split between these two digits and then there's the actual number itself. So if we go into here and we go into this place, you can see that there is this uh, chunk A, B. And if we do that, we can see that chunk A, B is actually linking to this place. What else is in here? Well, if you want to go deeper, you can kind of see um, there's the file, but there's also a lot of hidden files, which we'll go into later on. But the key part is that there is a, uh, a dot command dot sh. So if I go cat dot command dot sh, you can see that that's the task here. You can see this is the same, exactly the same thing as here that happened before. And then there's a dot command dot run, which is the thing. If you want to look in the logs, if you want to look at the errors, etc., you can jump into there as well. Not necessary for now. Don't, don't worry about this too much. It's going to go back and, uh, and go back to our original location there. But just to kind of show you kind of what's happening under the hood and you can see everything there. How can we view that in terms of what else we want to do with here? So we've got our pipeline here before. As I said before, you can change, override these parameters. Um, so just copy pasting from the example. What happens if now there's a situation where I ran it and the first process, split letters runs once. Split letters in this case is always going to run once but it created two files, right? Chunk AA and chunk B, AB, and therefore convert to upper ran twice. You kind of got this kind of like one-to-one -one in terms of the files. What happens if I do something like this? I'm gonna say next flow run here now. And instead of it being hello world, I'm gonna change it so that it's beyond these six characters. At the moment, it's splitting it in six characters. Uh, if I say hello, and now I'm just gonna copy paste from the example there, I'm gonna say bonjour le monde. Now when it splits this, it's not going to be two files anymore because it's going to be more than that. It's going to split it into three. And therefore, just by changing my input here and running this, when this launches, we'll see that we end up getting convert to upper running three times. And this would be the same if I ran it like with you know, a huge character. I mean, I can put whatever I want uh, in here. And it's going to split it by on that. And basically, whatever I place in there is going to be running, in this case, 10 times. Uh, and, and that's the, kind of the whole point about the parallelization that uh, you, however many files you've got, however many inputs you've got, Nextflow is driving the execution uh, based on the input, based on, based on what's called the, the elements in the channel. And uh, in our case, each of those files, each of those chunk files, is, a, is an element in the channel as well.